Hello and welcome to part three of Football and Sociology. Is the game a mirror of society is our question today and we touched on this in the last part. I want you to think about how football is everywhere in many respects. A newspaper has the big headlines on the front page, the big stories on the front page and the back page is invariably sport and by sport shorthand football is the priority at least in this country. Now that will be different in different countries obviously if you think of say America or India um, for example football will be way down the list but does that reflect their societies that reflect our societies and we're going to be looking at lots of different issues around how football and politics for example football and power football and money football and technology all interweave and link to each other and what that tells us about society too. Football is seen as the English game, at least in its infancy, but now you could argue it's the global game. If you look at the amount of people that watch the Premier League, either live, via some sort of streaming service or via some television service, it's absolutely massive. The English game, you could argue, is really the, the world's game in many respects, particularly the Premier League is what we mean by that. And we want to ask why, why that is, what does that mean? You know, you can see foreign football fans coming to British stadiums, coming to Premier League stadiums every every week that the season's on. And their experience, their mode of watching football, of experiencing it, you could say is very, very different to locals. What does that tell us about football? What does that tell us about society? If you look at the advertising around the last World Cup in Russia, you know, if you can pick out the logos there by McDonald's, Coca-Cola, Visa, massive massive corporations global reach yet I mean, in the case of McDonald's and Coca-Cola you could argue very much against you know a sporting endeavor not part of a healthy lifestyle you might argue and then there's the ways of playing and seeing the game too there's an idea I touched on this before when football first started the Scottish game was the passing game and the English game was the physical long ball tackles type idea if you talk about Dutch football teams, it, we generally mean the total football of Johan Cruyff and his generation. You know, Brazil is known as the Samba football, as it were, and that, that comes with all ideas around the style and what it means. Italian football is meant to embrace defence and everything is viewed through the prism of defence in, in Italy, is argued. Now, that's a massive generalisation and stereotype, but the fact that football is seen as cultural and regional is really interesting. You know, do certain players play the same position, but because one is Argentinian and one is Irish or Belgian or Chinese, do they play in a different way because of how they grew up watching the game and experiencing it and what their country for, expects of a player in that position? Likewise, there's an idea that there's modern football and there's traditional football and modern football is wrong. Modern football, you know, change is wrong. And you can link this, think about things like politics and maybe even postmodernism and versus traditionalism and things things like that against modern football is this sort of chant or this rallying cry that you hear amongst certain football fans and it goes back to what we talked about in previous ideas about authenticity and experiencing football the proper way and, and football you know it, it overlaps with politics it overlaps with identity in so many different ways Mesut Ozil as a Muslim is one of many Muslim players in the Premier League but he spoke out against what was going on in China in the Muslim community and that caused a whole issue for his club, for his country, for the sponsors, you know, all these issues. Chinese fans were sort of burning stuff and throwing it away and turning against him because his culture and their culture clashed, even though over football it had previously been embraced. And we see this with all sorts of issues when it comes to World Cups and tournaments and where the money comes from and who gets access to it and there's a lot of issues when it comes to the global aspect of football and those arguments around globalization you want to be thinking about the marxist ideas particularly that can come to the fore here you can you can see those ideas really clearly in criticisms of football in the same way you see criticisms of globalization generally i've mentioned a lot this idea of authenticity or legitimacy in football and the fact that fans will see different ways to experience and express that.
but we see authority in kind of Weber sense in different ways. Certain players have that charismatic authority. If you you look at sort of the South American flair players, you know, Ronaldo, the, the, the first Ronaldo, if you like, or the original Brazilian Ronaldo, R9, whatever you want to call him. Um, Maradona, you know, each generation, Messi, there seems to be this idea that South American players particularly have to play with flair or, or they're much more appreciated if, if they play with flair and they become icons because of it. Um, that, there's Europe, European players too. I mean, I, I idolised Paul Gascoigne as a player when I was a youngster, uh, Dennis Bergkamp. There are hundreds and thousands of examples throughout each generation, but players can command this authority. Think about David Beckham. He's, he became as much a brand uh, as well as a football player during his time in the 90s and into the 2000s. And that's continued almost. Then you get what's rational authority in football. Well, you have the referees. The referees and their assistants, they run the game. They have the job to enforce the laws and they work for the organisations which make the laws and they issue fines. So fans have this love-hate relationship with the officials, with the people that run the game. You know, they're often targeted for abuse and for chance within a stadium, but likewise criticism too. And you can see this idea of rational authority playing out through the people that officiate, essentially. And then you have traditional authority in football. Who's deserving? Um, you know, Sheffield FC, the world's first football club, is, is the kind of tagline. In the professional game, at least, Notts County and Crystal Palace have recently been embroiled in a who's the oldest football club. And that implies they have the most authority. Um, I mean, it's a very difficult thing to say, but fans will always tell you about why their club is one of the ones that deserve respect or should be at the top or, you know, they're, they're a proper football club, whereas certain other clubs aren't, for example. Um, that really is rooted into British psychology, maybe, and British society more than anywhere else because the game originated here. But if you look at other clubs, if you look at other countries, there's also a sense that a lot of clubs formed out of for different reasons, and we touched on politics in certain countries. Also, they're not necessarily just football clubs. When I visited Besiktas, I was really surprised to they have a boxing team. You know, Barcelona have a basketball team. In many European places, particularly, the football team is part of a wider sports club. So that can also give you clues to their identity and where they're coming from. And that can give you a sense of traditional authority as well within the game, who has this kind of prestige and this sense of being more deserving or more respected or more well known. Um, so again, we can see Weber's ideas coming out in football in many different ways when it comes to authority. One of the cliches in football is that a good referee is one you don't notice, but particularly as technology has come along and telev televised games have come along, there are you know celebrity referees, if you like, or referees that are very much well known. Um, you may know Pierre Luigi Colina there um, between Fernando Herrera and Roy Keane, I believe my uh, memory serves, you know, he was a very famous referee while he was refereeing because he's so distinctive looking because of how he controlled the game. And the evolution of refereeing is really fascinating. Referees used to, in very, very early football games, literally just keep time essentially. And when it was, even before it was 11 v 11, it was more of a mob versus mob kind of idea. Referees and officials were just there for, you know, keeping time, keeping, keeping people aware of what was going on. As the game has evolved, referees have had more power and you can argue had less power due to technology. So we're now in the early throes of VAR and the controversy that's come along with that. And this debate about should we allow for refereeing mistakes? You know, if you watch the 1966 World Cup final, does the ball cross the line or not? I mean, it's one of those age old debates. Obviously, England win 4-2 but because that goal is given is a very important decision, you know. Referees have assistance and they've even tried bringing in more assistance behind the goal too. And this has kind of been ridiculed by people. Yeah, football is divided on this issue. Should there be more or less technology? You know, should we embrace it? Um, it changes the modern fan experience as well by celebrating a goal that may well be ruled off soon after. You know, it causes heated debate, a massive range of emotions. And it brings into this question of whether it benefits football as a whole because only the richest clubs have them 
you know, they only have VAR in the top league. It's not something that's available to all football clubs. Um, I know even with goal line technology, some clubs can't have that for technical reasons. So the technology is not fair. It's not dem democratic in that respect, even amongst what you might consider the ultra elite clubs in the second tier of English football. Um, so as these changes come in, it's very interesting to see. And the referee has had more and more focus and scrutiny as time has gone on. So referees usually traditionally wore black, um, but you know I remember when they, they started to wear fluorescent colours and black kits came in, and you know they were more noticeable, and there was a change there necessarily in in the perception of a referee because of how they dress. So that plays into all kinds of sociological ideas. Technology, it's not just about what the referee has available to them; it's about the players too. You know, footballs. The idea that footballs are constantly being worked on, kits are constantly being worked on, it changes how the game is played. There was controversy before one World Cup about the flight of the balls that they were going to use because they seemed lighter and faster and it was going to cause more goals or it was going to change how the game was. Versus way back when you had what were essentially lever lace-up footballs and when these got wet they got very heavy and uh, you know, the pitches weren't as good. So the game was very different, the speed of the game, the way it was played was very different. And technology can alter that, you know, and, and can change literally the outcome of games because of it. So fans are very much aware of technology, I would say. And the last way in which it really changes is the fact we can watch games online now. We can stream them on our computers. We, can, we don't have to go to the stadium to see a football match. And that totally changes your engagement as an individual, as a collective. And also, you know, more people see that goal, that mistake, that decision, that injustice, that moment of drama, and it's replayed over and over again. So as we look at football in the media, you can think about, well, what does that show us in terms of things like hyper-reality and how we experience the game? Politics and football is a really fascinating um, little rabbit hole to delve down. If you look at something like the Hillsborough disaster, which for years was treated as a result of Liverpool fans being at fault uh, and arguments around justice for the 96 as the campaign is called there you know there's a pressure group there from Liverpool fans but it garnered national and international support and there's a big role in terms of what the media had to play particularly the Sun newspaper and tensions there and how football fans were treated and spoken about and I hold my hands up and say, as a kid growing up, I kind of believed the official lines more than anything else. And I was wrong about that. Um, but this played into ideas around the time from the Thatcher government and neoliberalism and the new right ideas that working class football fans were basically hooligans and were violent and were not to be trusted and needed the police to control them. So the police were essentially exonerated for their actions at Hillsborough for a long time. And this is difficult. Um, we're seeing around the world, though, time and again, dictators, particularly, or should we say, less democratic countries, you might describe them as, using football as a means to an end. Erdogan in Turkey has been using football as a way to boost national morale and promote certain ideas. Um, during this COVID-19 lockdown in Nicaragua, there was a really excellent article explaining how players were being forced to go and play. You know, it's a small nation, there's a lot of poverty there. And by going out and sort of risking their lives, as it were, they were, they were, they were following political power over their love of the game, as it were. And in Belarus too, I mean, it sounds strange. I've seen football fans in England watching the Belarus Premier League, you know, who'd even heard of half of these teams before. It shows this global and technological issues there, but also the fact that in these countries, the powers that be, the government, were using football as a way to show national strength or their strength as rulers. Um, another good example is in Hungary. Uh, Viktor Orban has put a lot of money into his local club and into certain football initiatives to help strengthen his, his ideas. And this goes all the way back to the early, early World Cups. You know, the second World Cup, 1934, Mussolini used it as a showpiece to show off Italian power. Hitler did a similar thing with the Olympic Games in 36, and Hitler had no idea about football, it seems, and wasn't interested in sport particularly. But he did attend one game. It's debated whether he attended two, actually, but one game to see the national side. And, 
you know, you'll see displays. There's a famous photograph of the English national team and the German national team doing Nazi salutes um, in the stadium. You know, it seems quite shocking to our eyes. But football has always been a good way of getting across a message to a large crowd, obviously. So that can play a part in it. And by having a successful football team, you have a successful nation in many respects. You know, when the World Cup comes to a country, it's a chance for that country to show off to the rest of the world. And there's huge debate around Russia and them hosting the tournament. The the behaviour of their fans, ironically, sort of language used to describe how English fans were described in the 80s. Um, so we can see a lot of the issues that we've talked about at play here. And politics is definitely, definitely linked to football throughout the world and arguably always will be now. Football and the media goes way beyond just news reports and coverage of games. There's also the way in which the press love to cover footballers, managers, you know, these are celebrities as well. They, they go from the back page to the front page, as it were, to use a kind of football terminology. Footballers are high profile. You know, you, you'll see them way beyond just, oh, they played a game or they scored this goal. Now it's about their lifestyle. It's about their celebrity in of itself. And that isn't necessarily a new thing. If you take someone like George Best, for example, you know, sort of painted as this charismatic, wonderful footballer, but also as a playboy, as a kind of media figure, as well as being, you know, a professional footballer for Man United and whoever else. I would say David Beckham was the one in my generation, again, previously mentioned him, who really encapsulated that. But you see it all over the world and you see it in terms of, you know, how these players are talked about and depicted and the clubs too. So it's it's no longer just reporting results in games, and I don't think it ever really has been for a long, long time. The fact that you have dedicated TV shows about football, um, the rise of things like Soccer AM, which is a kind of a lifestyle programme, it shows football in a certain way. The focus is more about the fans and fan culture, and this plays into the idea of habitus by Bourdieu, by Bourdieu and the sense that there's a way to live up to being a football fan and a football fan of a certain class, certain race, certain gender, certain idea and identity. Um, as we talked about, there are different types of football fans and the most sort of popular um, consensus about what a football fan is, is this young working class male idea. You might want to ask why that is. What do films and TV depict? Well, you get the hooligan subgenre, the green streets and things like that, which kind of glamorise the hooligan culture and maybe are misrepresented grossly, in my opinion. But then you have a, a range of films from sort of rags to riches, fairy tale, footballer type stuff, you know, even when Saturday comes, goal, that kind of stuff, to Bend It Like Beckham, which totally breaks the mould, you know talking about women's football and identity and other issues kind of the the outsider if you like in football way before the profile of women's football was as high as it is now so the actual things that people choose to spend money making for consumption when it comes to film and tv tells us a lot about how football scene and who's going to watch it likewise you have social media i mean there's still these persistent negative images within football and them negative ideas racism sexism homophobia which persist throughout social media and does that reflect social media in general you might want to ask yourself that likewise there's a whole set of language and almost in jokes if you like memes that are very football specific um you know, there's there's certain things like the starter pack meme where you get four pictures of, you know, haircut, drinks, trainers, that kind of stuff, which depict a certain type of fan. Um, and also the fact that consumption is going up massively on social media. Clubs themselves have a much bigger share as individual entities, as well as certain leagues, certain competitions. So the bigger clubs have a bigger global reach and this ties in through their use of social media. And this reinforces what it means to belong or to identify with that particular club, competition, brand, territory, whatever you want to think of it as. So all of these issues come back out again through football and the media. So don't just think of it as, oh, there's the sort of live coverage on a certain channel and then there's a highlights package that's on a newspaper report that's not football media anymore. Fans are making their own media. Fans are making vlogs and video blogs and podcasts and, and all sorts of things are going on to YouTube, onto Twitter, onto different platforms 
which shows what the state of modern media and state of technology is doing to our society and how that's reflected in football. So it's really fascinating. One of the biggest aspects to football is football consumption. Kit releases, products, merchandising is a huge source of revenue for the biggest clubs in the world and all clubs in some respects. There's huge debate over who designs the kit, what, what does it look like, how many kits are released a year. You know, for some fans, they must have every single kit, they must be complete, so they must spend that money, and then it causes a tension there of, you know, who can afford a kit, who cannot. Um, and kits can be priced really, really differently in different territories, for example, and designed very differently. So you'll find, um, particularly, you know, in this country, because there are so many clubs, big manufacturers will have identical kits for for teams and then the badges and sponsors are just different and so are the colours obviously. There are so many different things out there for the football fan to buy though, not just official merchandises, there are, like we talked about, magazines aimed at different audiences, there are podcasts, there are books, there are all of these things which are designed to cater for specific fans and specific groups of fans and it can be weird and wacky stuff too from you know i remember ipswich had a toaster at one point in the shop you know with the ipswich badge on the side of it um and that's just one club you know imagine what a, a massive global club like man united perhaps offer you know look it up barcelona Real madrid i'm sure they have some crazy merchandise in their shops that you wouldn't expect because it shows that people want to buy it so there's all kinds of sociological arguments around that and what does that mean and likewise there are games about the game itself from Subutio where you would flick the players um, and, and buy the players and collect them. Uh, and it creates a whole community and subculture there, right through to video games. You know, video games are about football, are as old as video games, really, from very pixelated 8-bit sort of very basic computer games that I would have played growing up right through to the first iterations of FIFA to what we see now where it's almost realism and it's, it's designed to look and be as immersive as possible. And it's not just playing the game and, and that fantasy that the technology and the media allows. There's being football manager too. There's management games which go way back and are more and more complex than ever now. And they try and give fans this fantasy, this, this sense of being just like their heroes, as it were. And that's part of the attraction of football is the escapism. And if, if you think about why those things are so popular, why people buy them and why they keep being made and improved upon, it shows really the appeal of football and it shows as well a lot of different ideas around not just consumerism and consumption, but norms and values and identity that we talked about before. You know, There's a reason people invest in these things, there's a reason people buy them. It, it obviously gives them some kind of identity and sense of self, which we talked about previously. So one thing that you can focus on particularly is this idea of merchandise and products and all of the other things which go way beyond sitting on a plastic seat for 90 minutes watching a game of football. So to conclude then, what does football tell us about society? Well, it might tell us everything and it might tell us nothing, you know, as much as a cop out as that sounds. What are you looking for? I mean, does social cohesion exist in football? Undoubtedly. Does social conflict? Yes. By its very nature. I mean, you've got their fans from different clubs in the same cities coming together to provide food banks for their versus, you know, all of these ideas around violence and masculinity and belonging and not belonging in terms of football fans and the rest of society. You've got massive amounts of greed and corruption and corporate spending. Um, those aren't all necessarily the same thing, by the way, but they co they collide and they combine in the governing bodies in the global nature of football. And you've got this sense of, is football diverse? Yes, it is. But is everyone trying to live up to the same ideals and the same success? Quite possibly too. So what is the overall dominant ideology in football? That's a trickier question to answer. You know, when it first started, there was a sense of it was playing like the English did because the English invented it. But it's gone way beyond that now. And this 
rises and falls of different nations, you know, Brazil, Italy, Holland, Spain, they've all had global dominance, as it were, in terms of the tactics and, and the type of way you play the game. But from that, then offshoots fan cultures. You know, a lot of English fans are now looking at the Germans going, we want to go over to the Bundesliga because they have the TIFOs and the fireworks and the, the sense of something that English fans feel they've lost and got rid of because of the globalisation. So it's interesting in that respect. And then if you think about just sociology, there are lots of different perspectives that you've learned about that you can see coming through in all of these videos, I hope, and lots of key terms coming out. So you can most certainly see those as examples provided here. I hope this series has been interesting. I hope it's allowed you to explore some ideas. I've had lots of fun making it, putting it together. As ever, there's a big reading list to go with this. I'll put some in the description for you. Please check out those articles and look at some of the excellent work out there, as I think it will really benefit your understanding. As always, leave your comments below, questions, come and see me, leave them in the classroom, email me, whatever. Really appreciate you taking the time to listen to this.